In mid-2019, AMD launched the RX 5700 XT, which was the highest in SKU in the new generation of graphics cards from the company, which were based on the RDNA architecture. The RX 5700 XT and its smaller brother, the RX 5700, were both produced using the Narve 10 die, 40 compute units with the RDNA architecture measuring 251mm squared. And this, of course, was also produced on TSMC's 7nm process. But despite these fairly impressive accomplishments, AMD have seemingly maintained a distance behind NVIDIA, thanks to NVIDIA's incredibly efficient architecture. This has not always been the case, however. If you recall back to, let's say, 2009, 2010, NVIDIA certainly had a few problems, and those problems were Fermi. The GTX 480, when it launched, was incredibly power-hungry. It put out a lot of heat. So, while the card was impressively fast, and people who purchased it were definitely happy in that respect, in terms of, let's say, noise levels, less so. The GTX 580 was an improvement over its predecessor in just about every single way, despite on the surface the two having a largely similar architecture. For those curious of NVIDIA's approach, Anantech did a great breakdown as to the differences. I'll link their uh, article in the video description. But in short, NVIDIA tweaked the actual design of the GTX 580 to improve performance in some situations, of course, and the clock frequencies went up against the GTX 480 as well. But they also went back to the drawing board, starting to tinker with the GPU at a transistor level, optimizing it by using fewer leaky transistors and focusing on monitoring the GPU's power consumption and temperatures, making power and uh, efficiency a priority, beefing up the cooling of the GPU as well. Well, just a few examples of this. And despite this card launching back of November 2010, NVIDIA, generally speaking, has typically continued to evolve this approach with subsequent generations of graphics cards. And despite the odd miss, here or there, in general, NVIDIA's architecture is extremely efficient. There's no better example of this than Pascal. One of the most infamous slides with Pascal was crafted for speed. Sure, there was a plethora of tinkering under the hood, which NVIDIA did for Pascal, such as better data compression and preemption, and I'm certainly not dismissing any of this. But the pure clock frequency is one I really want to focus on for now. The GTX 980 and its 2048 Maxwell CUDA cores ran at 1217 MHz, built on the 28NM process from TSMC. NVIDIA cranked this up to 2560 Pascal card, uh, CUDA cores, excuse me, um, boosting up to 1733 MHz, although, of course, with how uh, boost works on GPUs, frequently these clock frequencies could differ from this. This was built on the 16nm FinFET process from TSMC. NVIDIA optimized these chips heavily, drastically improving the performance of the GPU and reworking the design of the chip. As a result, Pascal, crafted for speed. Sure, the shrink of process compared to what we saw with Maxwell was certainly incredibly important for this achievement. As you can see in the slide though, a good portion of NVIDIA's accomplishments were also down to optimizations at the silicon level. But Paul, why are you discussing NVIDIA so much? You mentioned that we were going to be discussing AMD. Well, that's true, but I wanted to set up some groundwork to establish why NVIDIA have enjoyed a lead over AMD when it comes to the architecture side of the equation and what AMD are planning to do about it. So if you cast your mind back to 2018, Suzanne Palmer, we found out, joined the Radeon Technologies Group, and now her work is starting to pay dividends for the company. If you're unfamiliar with Suzanne Plummer, she was instrumental in the efficiency uh, equation when it came to Zen. I'm going to read out a quote from Suzanne, which actually dates back to 2018. Uh, a lot of what we did with Zen was trying to push what we thought we could do. And I think that's something we're trying to do in the graphics space as well, to make a bigger leap forward. 
We've pulled in some of the expertise in the microprocessor course team into the graphics team, kind of helping with our methodology and improving our performance and frequency and power. Just taking the best of what we already have developed in-house and trying to make sure we're using the same improvements across the company. End quote. Frequency, our performance, and power. Hmm. So according to my source, this optimization in design philosophy is now deeply ingrained in the upcoming Radeon graphics products. Suzanne and her team essentially moved to RTG after the completion of the Zen 1 design and has been hard at work tinkering with the silicon to optimize it. So the first generation of RDNA did have some of these efficiency improvements which were learnt from Zen. Indeed, we actually see a slide from AMD titled Streamlined Graphics uh, Pipeline. And I won't read out all of the information here, you can see it on screen. But if you look at effective gate slash clock, for example, there's a 12% difference between the optimizations in RDNA compared to GCN. But remember, when designing chips and architectures, it's not an overnight process. Depending upon the complexity of the chip, it can take two, three, four years for a product to become a reality when it originally started as just an idea in an engineer's head. I typically separate sources um, into a few distinct categories. The first category would be sources who have proven to be extremely reliable. Uh, for example, the source which told me the release of the Ryzen 3000 service was July 7th. Another source uh, which, which would be in this category provided me the uh, renders of the Radeon 7 along with a lot of the details way before an official announcement. And then I have kind of category two. This would be a source who, for example, provided me, oh, I don't know, the Rome information, which largely was accurate, but a few things were off here or there. And then I have category three, which would be like anonymous emails or links to a um, anonymous file dump, that type of thing. And obviously those uh, sources can be as accurate as category one, but you also can't necessarily verify them. So an example of that source would be the individual who told me that Rocket Lake is a backport. I'll classify them as category four, uh, sorry, category three. I would, with this source, classify them as category two, so they've been pretty reliable in the past. Unfortunately, one thing they can't tell me exactly is what AMD are doing under the hood with the second generation of RDNA. Uh, specifically revolving around the optimization for power. They are certain that the results are much better than the first generation of RDNA, but they don't exactly know what's changed under the hood, so to speak. My source tells me that Renoir and its GPU is a hint of what we can expect here. Well, the designers took an established GPU architecture, Vega, but improved it significantly over Picasso. Robert Halleck from AMD recently pointed out how different the Vega CU is in the third generation mobile part, being 59% faster than the second generation part. In other words, we see a significant uptick in performance simply because of optimization. Just how Nvidia has a team dedicated to optimizing the silicon to ensure the best performance and specific power optimizations are in place. AMD now has a similar team as well. This is not something you can necessarily heavily automate, and can be grueling work, but it will be of critical importance when facing NVIDIA. From what I understand, the first generation of RDNA, Nave, didn't really benefit from these optimizations which Suzanne's team is implementing, but the second generation most certainly does. My source though isn't sure how much of a performance uplift the second generation of RDNA will receive in terms of percentages based upon the circuit optimization and how much will come from the architecture. We have seen some hints though of what the second generation of RDNA will be capable of. With a benchmark, the big Nave or um, 
high performance Nava, whatever you want to call it, we see this card outperform quite easily, might I add, the RTX 2080 Ti. The heavily overclocked RTX 2080 Ti is beaten by about 17% in this virtual reality benchmark. And yet a stock RTX 2080 is being thrashed by around 30%. This is very impressive given it's an engineering sample for A and for B, NVIDIA typically does really well in this specific benchmark. From what I gather now from multiple sources, the second generation will feature improvements in performance because of the architecture, but also considerably more compute units compared to RDNA 1, and Nave second generation will also scale much better and able to achieve higher clock frequencies too. From what another source told me, and I released this as an exclusive just prior to CES, the cards will not launch until summer, although there is no specific date provided right now. And um, we actually have as well the name of the RX 6000 series. Assuming we see, let's say, mid-summer, this gives AMD quite a bit of time to bring up both drivers and finalise the design of the card. And who knows what state the silicon was of this uh, engineering sample when it was benchmarked. We can also say that this ties in nicely what we're learning about the PlayStation 5 and also the next generation Xbox. I've personally seen internal testing documents of the PlayStation 5 running at 2 GHz for native mode, i.e. what the PlayStation 5 will run at with PS5 software. Given the power consumption of a 40 compute unit RX 5700 XT hits the low 200 watt mark when clocked to 2 GHz, you can see how important the optimizations will be. Likely, the second generation of RDNA from AMD and future Nave cards, with the potential exception of Nave 12, will benefit drastically because of this improved efficiency, and with any luck, we'll see higher clock frequency on the GPU and lower heat output. I will also quickly add a caveat that for the PlayStation 5 GPU, it'll be interesting to see whether this is just purely a development kit or whether it's a retail console. I also recently covered that AMD are working on RDNA 3, which comes as little surprise given that they seem to be taking so many design influences from how they handle CPUs. Multiple teams work on different Zen cores, and we know that AMD is working right now, at the very least, on Zen 5, using what's known as a leapfrog design approach. AMD have discussed this at length several times before in interviews, but the gist is that Team A will be finishing Zen 3 right now, and writing reports and providing information to Team B and C, who are working on designing Zen 4 and 5. The RX 6000 series will debut in summer, and the Narve 21 and Narve 23 silicon, although it's potentially possible there is more for the second generation, will definitely benefit heavily, not just because of the lessons learned from developing the first generation of RDNA, but also other lessons, such as the development that uh, AMD are providing for the PlayStation 5 and Xbox APUs. There are also reports floating around on the internet that Big Narve is over 500mm squared, and unfortunately I can't get that information verified with any of my sources. Believe me, I have done some digging around, I've just been told that the next generation uh, architecture does support significantly more compute units at higher clock frequency, but I can't get a measurement right now of the die size. But Without any question, it's going to be interesting to see what AMD are capable of with these uh, enhancements in terms of efficiency and just how they will fare against NVIDIA and the might of the RTX 30 series when it launches. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. If you did, then of course, get subscribed to the channel if you've not already, and also give the video a like and share it on the social media platform of your choice. But for now, I'm going to thank you all for watching the video, and I'm going to wish you an amazing day. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.